Today's scripture reading is going to be 1 Chronicles 17, 24 through 27. So let it be established that your name may be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O oh my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, you are God and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that I may continue before you forever, for you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. Hello, good morning, Sun Valley Church of Christ. Glad you are with us this morning. Hopefully you are as excited to be here as God is to have you here. It is a blessing to be in his pulpit, preaching his word to his people. It is a blessing and I'm grateful you're here. Want to welcome our guests. If you are a visitor, remember that's your choice. We want you to be here permanently. And uh, we hope you like what you see and we like, you like that, uh, God's word is being preached and you want to come back at the next appointed time. And you might be wondering when that is. That'll be six o'clock this evening. Hopefully you can find time, make time uh, to be here with us again for another portion of God's word. What a joy it is to stand here and be the oracle, the orator of God's word, to share a message with you to help us to grow in our understanding of God and what it means to be a servant of the Most High God. Sometimes we forget how high our God truly is. Sometimes we like to lower God to our level instead of letting God raise us to His. And we have to be mindful of those things as we go out into a world that doesn't see righteousness as a way of life but see it as a way of judgment. God is righteous. And in his righteousness, he sent his only begotten son to this world to be the sacrifice for our sin. And you know, that should within us develop a love. A love that is undefeatable, undeniable, and inconquerable. A love that would never put anything before him. There was a teacher one time teaching class and she was asking their students, so what do you, what, what do you want to be in the future? What do, you, what do you have in mind for the future? Well, the little girl, Lori, in the front of the class said, I want to be a doctor. Little girl, Karen, said, well, I want to be a police officer. Susie in the middle of the class raised her hand, said she wanted to be a rich and famous actress or a model. So when the teacher asked Johnny what he wanted to do in the future, he said, I want to marry Susie. I said that to say this, the flesh is always looking for the easy way out. You know, the flesh is always trying to come up with an easy way, safe way, right? The quick way. But there's only one way, and that is God's way. All of us want to be married to success. But the world doesn't understand what success is. The question is, they want to be married to success, but whose success are they looking for? The divorce rate between man and success is very high. Most of the time because they're looking for their own success and not God's way. Isaiah 55, God is very clear. My ways are different than yours. I'm the most high God. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So we have to make a transition. We have to let go of our old ways because those ways are leading us to death. Where God's ways, although sometimes confusing and oftentimes hard, are the ways that lead to success. And the success in God's book is life eternal with Him. That's success. 
That's what it's about, folks. This life is a life of just passing through. God has promised success to the faithful. That success is now this life continues with him in eternity. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, and, and, and I want to throw this out there. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 tells us that Old Testament that we got, we're not bound by the old law. We get that, we understand it, but that Old Testament is there for our learning. So we can see the mistakes that have been made and the victories that were made and implement them into our lives. In Jeremiah chapter 6, Israel was in the habit of loving God when it, things were good, but trying to find another way when things were not so good. And I see a lot of that in the world today. In Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, God cries out through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient path. Let your life be given victory by doing the things that God is leading you to do. You know, by the ancient path, where the good way is, God will show us the good way. Sometimes the good way is not always our way. So we learn to let go of our way, to stay in the good way, and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. That's the success. When we're not letting the old ways let them go, then we're not desiring the success that God is trying to offer, and that is rest for our souls. And look at the answer. They said, we will not walk in your ways. Now, it isn't like Israel said, yo, God, <laughs> we decided we're not going to walk with you. It didn't say that. It's their decisions, the way that they were living their life, told God, their actions proved to God that they weren't going to walk by his command by his way, and here's the key, to his success. First John chapter 5, verse 14. A lot of us understand that verse by saying, God says he's going to answer any prayer that I give him. Anything that I ask, God's going to give it to me. But when you look at verse John 5, 14, he does say that, but he throws in, According to his will. Folks, we need to know the will of God. We need to understand that his will is for us to live successfully with him. His will is how we get there. That's unchangeable. He has a desire, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, for all men to be saved, but that is not going to happen. Not all men are going to be saved. So there's, there's a difference between God's desire and God's will. The difference is God's desire is for all men to be saved. His will is how all men will be saved. That doesn't change. That's God's will. And so when we're praying for people, um, we need to know how to pray. When we pray, Folks, if you leave here with nothing more than this, you're leaving with the gold mine. When we pray, we should pray for God's victory. What it is that God is trying to do. Not what, what we are trying to do. We are like the blind man leading the blind man. And where do they end up? In the ditch. Jesus said that not so much as a physical blindness, but a spiritual blindness. If we're walking according to our will, then we're going to end up in that ditch. And I've had people come and say, let me pray or pray for me in this way. Uh, we pray for them, right? They say, well, well, Cub, I've got some problems in my life. Pray for me. Ask the church to pray for me. We pray for them, and then they're not there Sunday. What are we praying for? If you're not going to do what God wants us to do, what are we praying for? We're praying for God's victory in your life. And if we're not going to walk in his ways, what are we praying for? We as a Christians understand that. Jesus' disciples said, came up to Jesus and said, you know, John's teaching his disciples to pray. Why don't, why don't you teach us how to pray? And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus does just that. And I want us to learn from that prayer, not to... Uh, the, the whole idea of this prayer isn't that we pray word for word, but to understand how to pray. Sanctify God's person. 
I did a great job this morning in his prayer. You know, we need to understand who this God is and not make him who we think he ought to be. When we say, God, give us the victory, what we are saying is your victory, not mine. Sanctify him. Seek his promise. What is it, what it, is, that, what, what is it that God promised to me? Little sidebar. If you're here because you think God said he's going to make your life better, that's wrong. He didn't say that. Seek his promise. See, because some people are doing that. They're coming to God saying, make my life better. God didn't promise that. What God promised is to give us a better life. And to do that, we got to let go of the old life. So seek God's promise. Solicit God's providence. Understand that soliciting in this idea means not sell it, but to really, really want that. That's what I want. I want what you provide, God. Not what I provide but what you provide. And then, here's the key, share God's pardon. Be a loving and forgiving person like God so willfully showed each and every one of us. So the first step that we need to get to and what we need to talk about is to the sanctification. When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he said, pray then in this way in verse 9, our Father who is in heaven. That's a spiritual father, and you don't get no higher than that, folks. You know, I, I was in, in, in uh, at Bear Valley, we were in chapel one day, and this guy got up and said a prayer and said, Daddy, please, Daddy, wait a minute. <laughs> He's our father. That is a, the Abba Father is a cry of high respect. And we want to bring him down to our daddy level instead of letting him raise us to the Abba Father level yes it is a special relationship but it is a relationship that has to do with sanctification somebody as high as our god we need to sanctify thank i for his prayer sanctified in his creation in his command in his compassion he is our god he's our creator jesus said when you talk to god put him in that place sanctify him our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. That word hallowed means to separate from profane things. I don't want to serve a profane God. I want to serve a God that is above all things. He is our creator. He has a, a first place in everything. He should have that place in our lives. And believe me, Satan is looking for a crack because if, if, if he can take a portion of your life and say, you, you, you make you decide that you aren't going to put God first there, he's going to open your whole life and put God on the back burner in your whole life. Folks, don't give him that crack. Sanctify this God, this God that we worship, this God that we serve, this God that we love as top priority, number one. Hallowed be your name you talk about his name you talk about sanctifying him you know we have to understand his name it's not sanctify god oh god's first place no his name everything that god is about his name we say well don't use his name in vain well don't say god no 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 don't use his name in vain his name is christian don't use that name in vain don't go around and call yourself a Christian and not act like, not be a Christian. That's using his name in vain. So when we talk about sanctifying God and his name, his name is transformation. He's the potter. Paul said, well, God is the potter. He, we are the clay. He has the right to sanctify the, the, use, the, use, uh, the, the set apart ones from the daily ones. He is the potter. Don't. Paul said, don't let the world be the potter. Don't let the world conform you, but let God be the potter by transforming you, by renewing the mind. Sanctify our God as the potter, the one that is molding your life. 
the one that your life is for. Sanctify him as protector. Remember Jesus talked about the value that we have in God's eye. More than sparrows who don't work or worry or anything and get fed every day. And you are more valuable than those. Don't let things of the world stop you from doing what's right. Every time that you tell the world you're going to do something that's right, they're going to come back and say, why are you doing that? That's not good. And then the whole idea of Satan there is to get us to say, oh, I don't want to lose my friend or I don't want to be wrong, so I won't do it. No, 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 no. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Be faithful until death. Sanctify God as the protector. Trust in him. Lean on him. Let his way be your way. He will protect us. The psalmist said we hide under the shadow of his wings. We are there in his protection. We're accomplishing his will through his power and his perfection. His protection. And then, and then the idea of perfection. We, we, we talked a little bit about that the other day. Being perfect. Nobody's perfect. God is the perfecter. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 14 reminds us that, that, that God is working in our lives to bring us to that perfection. Turn in your Bibles real quick over there. Hebrews chapter 10, and look at, uh, let's look at verse 14. Because this is important. He says, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are what? Sanctified. Those who are set apart. You are set apart because you set God apart. You sanctify him. Hallowed be your name. You are the Almighty. You know, we live in a world that can't even come to the conclusion that this wonderful world and the intricacy of how this world is working, the tilt, the whole idea. You read in the Bible and it says God separated our sins as far as east is from the west. That's telling us science that the world is round. Because if he separated as far as north is from south, you start north, you start heading south, you're going to end up heading north. But east, if you head east, you'll never go west. It's that far separate. God told us the world was round. The world can't even come to that conclusion. They don't have the brains. They don't have the faith. They would rather say, Big Bang happened. I'll tell you, there's an old story about a man that was walking one time, and he tripped over something. He looked down, and it was a watch. So he picked up this watch, and in this watch is beautiful. Uh, choice metals, everything was moving, everything was working, the hands were ticking, it was just a beautiful piece of work. So then what does the, the, the man say about the watch? Well, it said all these, all these medals and all these jewels came together by chance. They just fell here and came together. By chance, these little wheels and these little levers and everything that has worked, that all happened by chance. By chance, they wound themselves and it keeps the time going. By chance, this watch is working. What we say at Sun Valley is, ah! Wrong answer. He didn't say that. What he says is, I have found a watch. There must be a watchmaker. This is intricate. This is beautiful. People, God created this world. It didn't happen by chance. God created his church. It didn't happen by chance. The things in our life don't happen by chance. Sanctify God as the one with the power and control and dominion in your life. When you pray, pray this way. When we pray, we also need to make sure that we are seeking God's promise. What is it that God promised? Notice what he said back over there in Matthew chapter 6. Let me get back over there real quick. Matthew chapter 6. He said, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, 
A lot of people say, we don't say that prayer anymore because God's kingdom did come. And I agree with that. But you got to understand what is Jesus doing? He's teaching the disciples how to pray, not what to pray, but how to pray. What, it is, what is the promise here? Well, the promise is that God's kingdom is going to come. And how will we know that kingdom? Because God's will is being done here at Sun Valley as well as, as, it, as it is in heaven. Ooh, is that what we're seeking? Are we seeking things for our pleasure, our entertainment, things that make us happy? See, there are three things. If you go to Ephesians chapter 5 and you look at verses 15 through 17, we're going to notice three things that must be done in our lives to do God's will. Okay? Look what he said. In verse 15, therefore, be careful. Folks, we, we, we're not careful when it comes to God. It's nonchalant sometimes, just, you know, no, no thought behind it, no consideration, no prayer behind it. You know, uh, we were studying with a young lady the other day, and we brought up Wednesday nights. And there's a lot of us that probably know this, but there's a lot of us that probably don't. Do you know, years ago, what Wednesday nights were for? prayer night. Wednesday nights, the church got together and prayed. Oh, we would do well to get a night to get everybody together and just pray. Set everything else aside and come together as God's people and pray. Oh, be careful. Paul says, he says, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. You know, take the precautions that are needed. Do the right things. Be careful. That word means use godly discernment in every step. That plays a big part. Why do bad things happen to good people? Not always, but sometimes they didn't use the right discernment to tell them what to do when to do it God says if you'll be careful use godly discernment in every step you take number two be cultivated he goes on to say making the most of your time because the days are evil there's evil in this world this world is evil we are sojourning we have to pass through this world and there's nothing in this world that loves God and his name or his cause, especially not his promise. So we need to be those people that are what? Doing God's will. This is the promise. This is what God asks us to do, to be careful. Make the most of your time. Redeem, the word redeemed is used there. Be careful. And use your time, you know, redeem it. See it as valuable and use it in ways that's going to bring God the glory. Doing the things that God wants us to do. Be wise. Be cognizant. Be aware. Be wise. That word wise is, means to be skilled in God's way. Wise people, right? They are being skilled. They redeem the time. Paul uses this three times in the Bible, and it means to buy out. Buy out of the evil world the time that is good for God. Use your time wisely. Don't let the world and its evil become your time. Take your time out and step aside and live for God. See, the foolish people of this world, as Paul goes on to say, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We don't want to be, see, the foolish people, they live this world with no reason. There's no reason. Ask them, why? I don't know. Yeah, why are you here? I don't know. I don't know. We have a reason. Paul talked about, we have a reason why we work. We're created in good works. 
Yeah, there's a reason for that. There's a, there, there's a reason for our worship. Why? We worship in spirit and truth. Why? Because God is seeking those worshipers. I got a reason why I'm worshiping here today. Because my God, the one that I sanctify, the one that I pray to, the one that I want to do his will, he is seeking somebody that wants to worship him that way. That's why I worship in spirit and truth. And then my wrestle with the world. The world's out there fighting the air, fighting the battles of the world. We are fighting the good fight of faith. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. We have a reason to fight. We are fighting to help people find their way to the citizenship that we enjoy, which is in heaven. The fight, the good fight. There's reason for what we do. Even in the way we talk. You know, I was with a friend and he was out there looking for a car. And he was talking to the used car salesman. And the used car salesman says, well, when one door opens, the other one closes. And I thought, wow, he's, there's a relig religious conversation going on here. And he goes, other than that, it's a good car. And I thought, well, so much for the religious side of it. God promises abundant life, and folks, he does open the doors. He does make sure that we understand, but we need to be people that understand the promise. What is it that we, when we pray, Jesus said, pray then in this way, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. We are here because God's promise is true. That kingdom did come. That kingdom is established right here at Sun Valley. We are the people that do God's will. This is praying in success. This is what we want to be successful in. God's will, not man's way. And to understand this, then we, we understand God's providence. See, God gives us what we need to be successful in this prayer life, in this life that he gives us that has to do with prayer. Some people use prayer like a soda machine and only pray to God when they want something. God is not saying that. God is not teaching us that. He's showing us that he is a God that wants to be there for us. And he will provide for us the things that we need. As Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. That's a very unique word because when we pray to God, when we ask God, we need to understand his resolution. I remember in Exodus chapters 16 and 17, they were hungry. And they said, what are we going to do, Moses? You brought us out here to die in the desert? And Moses asked God and God gave him bread. Was good for a while, but then they wanted something more. God gave them quail. That was good for a while, but they wanted some. Wait a minute. Do we want what God provides? Or do we want something more? Do we want something that goes beyond? See, God provides daily for us. Now, this word is only used twice in the whole New Testament. Once here and once in Luke's version or account of Jesus teaching here. So it's a very special word. And, 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 and it shows that God is providing the necessities. Give us our daily bread. Give us the necessities of each and every day. God provides for us. And I'm going to show you. He provides daily necessities for each and every one of us. He provides the things that we wear. Remember in Matthew chapter 6, they were wondering about sandals and clothes. Jesus said, God will take care of you. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. God will add these things to you. He will give you. He will provide the things that you need. And I'm not saying be a fool and say, well, the God said I don't have to work. Wait, Paul said back in the Thessalonians letter that if you don't work, you don't eat. So you can't use man's logic behind what we're saying here. But what we are saying is don't put your needs before your God. Because your God 
said he will supply what you need through your faith, through your action. We see a world that says, oh, I can't worship because I work on Sundays and I can't go there because I have to pay my bills. Well, you're killing yourself to get things that God says, if you'll just seek him, he'll give you. The things that you need, I'm not saying he's going to go give you a million dollars. Don't get me wrong, right? Right, Eugene? He didn't say he's going to give us a million dollars. You know why, Eugene? Because he said Eugene don't need a million dollars. Eugene needs a red tie for Sunday. And believe me, I think he got a red tie. Yeah, 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 well, imagine that. See, God is good that way. He provides for us the things that we wear. He provides the words. Jesus said, don't go, go out and preach the word. Don't worry about the words you're going to say. God, God will give you these words. Now, these are miraculous events right here when God gives the words. But we have God's word right here. It's called the Bible. These are the words that we say. You don't have to worry about what I'm going to say over somebody's house when I go visit them. You know? Me and Victor were talking about that other, the other day. What do we say? Well, you know, you talk about the common things in life, but you tie them in to God's word. God will give us the words that we say. And don't get confused on what makes you rich, folks. Laodicea, a very, very rich town, and that drains into the church. And they thought they were rich. And Jesus said, well, you better rethink this because you need to go buy the right clothing, which is a white robe, not a purple one, right? You need to get some ISAB because you ain't seeing things clearly. And you need to get gold that is refined by fire, not your money gold, but the gold that God makes us rich with. And that is his love, trusting in him. Being there for him. Being the, the spokesman for his word. The key to the joy of being a Christian is found in contentment. We have to be content with these things. The things that God offers. If we look over at Hebrews chapter 10 or chapter 13 and we look at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. See, this is where we lose our relationship with God because we're not content with what God has given us. We leave God to go get what we want. And then we're just like Laodicea. We think we're rich, but really we're poor. We're really poor so when we pray we should ask God to give us the daily necessities and trust in him and be content with the things that he gives us you know there are three preachers in a coffee shop one day discussing prayer and they were discussing about which is the right position in prayer and one preacher said oh you, you, you pray with your hands clasped in front of you with your head bowed. The other preacher said, no, 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 no. No, the best way to pray is to stand up with your palms lifted up. Third preacher said, no, no. You, you, you sit down and you pray with your eyes closed. Well, there was a telephone linesman working with him, uh, working, uh, and he was sitting in that coffee shop with him, and he couldn't hold back anymore. And he said, I'll tell you where I found the best way to pray was hanging upside down on a telephone pole. Sometimes God provides what we need to be right with him. My telephone pole was an eight-foot hole. God provided that hole for me so I would find him in prayer. Folks, Understand God's providence. Be content with what it is that God offers us, what it is that God gives us. Jesus said, pray like this. Ask for God to give you what is necessary in life. The fourth way that we pray is to share God's pardon. If you go back over to Matthew 6 and see how Jesus closes this section out, he says, 
and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Folks, what we want to do when we pray is be willing to forgive. This is, this is the hardest thing we have as humans to understand. Forgiveness reaffirms love for the erring. When that person is erring, they are in bad enough shape. They don't need our judgment. They don't need our condemnation. They need our love. They need our forgiveness. And when we forget that, folks, we forget who forgave us. You know, there's a story, and in, in, in I think it's Matthew 18, that talks about a man that went out and owed a king a lot of money. And the king forgave him. And then this man went out to another man that owed him a very little amount of money and beat the guy to a pulp because he didn't get his money. And so the king went back after him and said, send him out in the outer darkness. Why did, why did Jesus tell that story? To remind us how much God forgave us so that we would share that forgiveness with others. To be there for them, to help them. Forgiveness also, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Forgiveness does something else. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, be diligent to preserve the unity in the spirit of the bond of peace. It keeps unity in the church. There's a reason why we forgive. We're one. And when one hurts, we all hurt. And when one needs comforting, the body comforts that one. It keeps that unity. And it keeps us also in the image of Christ. Do you remember Matthew chapter 26? And Jesus said, these little driplets of blood are dripped for the forgiveness of sin. No. He said what? They're poured out. My blood is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. If we are going to be in the image of Christ, that forgiveness pours out. It's there for people. Brothers and sisters, I need your forgiveness. I'm a human being. I love to preach, yes. But sometimes I let words come out of my mouth that shouldn't come out. Even in the pulpit. And I ask your forgiveness. Words that sometimes might be misinterpreted. Words that shouldn't be said from the pulpit. And I ask your forgiveness. And your forgiveness from me is there for you. I need your forgiveness. You need mine. We all need God's. We share that forgiveness. We share that pardon. Young man one time ran into the doctor's office and he was hysterical. And he said, doctor, he said, doctor, I, 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 think, I'm, I, I think I'm shrinking. And the doctor said, now, just settle down. You'll have to be a little patient. Now, I could tell that joke. Right? Because I am a little patient. I need God's healing. I need God's forgiveness. I need to have a little patience. I don't want to be like the bad doctor and have no patience. That's a free one. <laughs> we need patience. We need to have that forgiveness for God. I encourage you. Be a little patient. Help each other, be there for each other, strengthen one another, because as Jesus finished that, he said, if you're not willing to be, forgive, uh, be forgiving, then we shouldn't ask the, God, the Father, our God, for forgiveness. And everybody needs that forgiveness. So we want to share that pardon with other people. The gist of what we're saying today is prayer works when God is working in us. We don't want to pray with a fleshly mindset. We want to pray with a loving mindset of God. 
To do that, we need to make sure that we sanctify God for who he is. We need to seek his purpose in our lives, and we need to solicit, be content with what God provides us, and we definitely want to share God's pardon. You know, it's all about forgiveness, because that's where it starts. You know, the goal of a Christian is not forgiveness. The goal of the sinner is forgiveness. When we become a Christian, our goal now is holiness. To be holy like our Father in heaven is holy. But it starts with forgiveness. I want to encourage you today. If you're here and you haven't went to God and asked God for the forgiveness of your sins, and then not only ask Him, but be willing to do what He asked you to do to find that forgiveness, I pray you'll make that decision today. And you'll find as you study in the Word, you're going to see that God says, repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're here and you're not being baptized, I pray you'll make that decision today. So God can share that forgiveness with you. And we as a church can gather around you and encourage you. And if it's forgiveness that you found, but now you're seeking holiness, because now that's our goal. Satan's out to defeat that goal. He doesn't want us to be holy people. He would rather see us as holier than now people. But we don't want to be that kind of people. So the things that he uses, like deaths in the family or illnesses or unpaid bills or struggles of everyday life, God says, come to me and I'll take those from you. I'll provide for you the victory. I will give you the pardon you need and I will assure you rest for your soul. Don't ever, ever forget those promises. Today, if you need reminded of those promises, you need a hug. You need someone such as Don or Kathy to cook you a meal or maybe Kenny to give you a hug, maybe a chocolate pie. Right? I'm not saying I'm out yet, Kenny. No, no, no. But I just want you to know you have a family here that loves you and wants to help you. And we will help you today. If it's baptism that you need, God will provide. If it's forgiveness, it's prayers, God will provide. He'll do that if you'll let him. Please take this opportunity this morning to come forward as we stand and we sing.